first just like to welcome everyone. My name is Jess Posner. My pronouns are she and they, and I am the director of the Virtual Y at the YMCA of Central New York. I am a white woman in her mid-30s with brown asymmetrical hair, glasses, and I'm wearing a black dress. The background behind me is a dynamic blue and purple Y branded digital background. I am very excited to welcome you to today's virtual lunch and learn seminar, Knee and Hip Arthritis with Dr. Max Grinke and Stacy Griffith from Syracuse Orthopedic Specialists, also known as SOS. For over 30 years, SOS has been the trusted provider for total orthopedic care near Syracuse, New York. From broken bones, chronic pain, sprains, joint replacement, and much more, SOS's orthopedic specialists can help. To learn more, please visit the SOS website, sosbones.com. Before I introduce our guests, I'd like to orient us all to our virtual meeting platform, Zoom. Please keep your audio muted for the entire program unless you are explicitly invited to unmute. If you would like to communicate with me or ask questions, please use the chat function, which you can access on the bottom of your screen if you are joining in a computer or in the three dots if you are joining via mobile or tablet. Following the presentation, there will be time for a Q&A, so please do share your questions with us in the chat if you didn't already send them ahead of time, and thank you so much to those of you who already did. We have enabled live transcription of the event. From a computer, you can turn this on by clicking Live Transcript, which is the CC icon in the menu at the bottom of your screen, and selecting Show Subtitle. From mobile or tablet, you can access these sittings by clicking the three dots. Finally, you will notice that tonight's event is being recorded. Only the, this afternoon's event is being recorded. Only the speaker's video feeds will be included in any publicly shared version of this event. And we suggest viewing tonight's program in speaker view. From a computer, you can adjust this in the upper right-hand corner of the Zoom window by clicking view. From mobile or tablet, you should automatically be in speaker view, but you can swipe to change your views. Also, once the presenters um, turn on their PowerPoint, you'll notice that the PowerPoint gets really big and their images get very small. There's actually a slider that's going to be between the small image of the speaker and the big image of the PowerPoint that you can slide around and make um, change the sizes of those things. And finally, um, I'd like to thank everyone in your generosity for creating this beautiful community space of listening and learning this afternoon. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our esteemed guests, Max Grinke and Stacey Griffith. And I'm just going to spotlight them, but there's a lot of you. So I'm just going to take me a moment to find them. All right. Um, so Max, Dr. Max Greenkey will present first, uh, followed by Stacy Griffith. Dr. Max Greenkey, who is here with us in the mask, is a fellowship trained surgeon who specializes in hip and knee joint replacement. Dr. Max Greenkey completed a fellowship in adult reconstruction surgery at Duke University Department of Orthopedic Surgery. He completed his residency and internship at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia, where he was named academic chief resident in 2019. He received his medical degree from the Sidney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University and received his bachelor's degree from the University of Pennsylvania, graduating magna cum laude. Dr. Max Greenkey has joined the SOS joint replacement team, which includes his father, Dr. Seth Greenkey, MD, and uncle, Dr. Brett Greenkey, MD, both founding partners of SOS and joint replacement surgeons. Stacy Griffith, who will follow Dr. Greenkey's um, presentation, is a physical therapist, certified MDT, and is the coordinator of the Total Joint Program for SOS Orthopedic and Sports Therapy. Stacy is a graduate of both Damon College and SUNY Potsdam and has advanced certification in McKenzie Mechanical Diagnosis and Therapy of the Spine. So without any further talking from me, um, Dr. Greenkey, the virtual stage is yours. Okay, perfect. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, you sound great. Excellent. So I'm going to load up my talk here, and there's probably more slides that we can get to in just a half hour, but 
uh, hopefully it can serve as just some uh, a launching point to, to a lot of the common questions about um, um, what arthritis is and what, what the treatment for it is. So, okay. <clears throat> so thanks for everybody for joining me. So, you know, basically I wanted to start off by talking about like what a normal joint is and how do you go from normal for, to something that's, that's pathologic. And so in a normal joint, <clears throat> the ends of the joint are lined with something called cartilage, which is sort of like the yellow shiny stuff on the end of a chicken bone. And what the cartilage normally does is it cushions us when we walk and it allows us <clears throat> to um, walk with cushioning within and the joint to move without friction, without pain. And when it wears out, that's when you get arthritis, right? And so the hip joint is a ball on a socket made up of the top of the thigh bone, which makes up the ball called the femur. And the socket is made up of the pelvis and it uh, moves rotationally in 360 degrees. Knee joint, a little bit different. It's more of a hinge joint. And there's actually three compartments, right? The inside one called the medial, the outside one called the lateral. And then the last one is called the patella femoral, or that's behind your kneecap, right? And then it's made up of stabilizing ligaments on the sides of the knee. And then in the middle that prevent it from moving forward and backwards. And then also the menisci, which are um, sort of the bumper pads of the knee and then act as secondary stabilizers. So, you know, as I said, arthritis is wearing out of the cartilage. And when it wears out, that's when you sort of lose that lubrication, the cushioning, and joints become progressively more painful. And there's a couple different kinds of arthritis. There's just sort of osteoarthritis, which is regular wear and tear arthritis that you can blame on your mom and your dad. There's rheumatoid arthritis or other inflammatory arthritis, which means that it's a systemic, uh, something going on with your entire body that causes systemic inflammation and that localized in the joint. And the last one that's not on here is called post-traumatic arthritis. That means you've had an injury in the past that caused arthritis. <laughs> and so, um, <clears throat> you know, it starts off sort of spotty and then progresses to either occupying either one of the compartments or all of the compartments. And as that happens, your pain can start to present as either sometimes coming up out of nowhere and that can resolve. And then eventually it becomes more common, more frequent and more progressive and more severe. Um, so to begin with knee uh, arthritis, can you guys see my pointer here? hopefully. And so over here, I'm pointing out a normal x-ray. And so this is the bottom of the thigh bone called the femur and the top of the leg bone called the tibia. And if you look across the joint here, there's nice space in between both joints. Now, if you come over here <clears throat> to the other side, you can see on the outside here, still some joint space. And as we move onto the inside, it becomes that space is gone. And that's what we call bone on bone. And then over here on the right is sort of an end stage arthritic um, joint where the joint space is almost completely gone. And then we have these bone spurs here, here, and here, and those are called osteophytes. So again, just a normal hip here, top of the thigh bone called the femur, makes the ball and the ball in the socket. Socket is made up of our pelvis. And again, nice round head here, nice space in between the ball and the, uh, and the socket. <clears throat> and so if you look over here, here's the progression again. So if you look again here, you can see some space here, but as we move towards the inside, there's less space. And then here you can see an osteophyte up here as well. And then this is one that the joint space is completely gone. And then the ball itself is starting to collapse. And so, you know, what, how do we treat arthritis when we do about it? So unfortunately, there, there's nothing in modern medicine that I can do or any of my partners can do to put the cartilage back into your joint. And so what we do is we treat the symptoms, right? And we always start with the least amount of intervention and we sort of work our way up, right? And so least amount is, is modifying your activities, doing things differently. It can be an exercise program to change, to strengthen the muscles above and below um, the joint, take some pressure off of it. It can be anti-inflammatories. It can be losing some weight to take off um, <clears throat> um, pressure off the joint. It can be injections. And the most drastic thing that you can do to treat it is a knee replacement or a hip replacement. Um, and so just, you know, in, in this day and age, I think it's like important to remind us that actually none of our academies recommend using opioids or narcotics to treat arthritic pain before you have an operation. So, um, you know, this is just sort of talking about what we discussed already. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, to get a little bit more into, um, and I'm sure Stacy could probably touch on this a little bit, but the idea of physical therapy or um, activity is that 
um, <clears throat> if you strengthen the muscles above and below the joint, you can take some pressure off it. And then one thing that comes up a lot is, is people with higher BMIs and how does that affect your, your arthritis and how does it affect the operation? I think there's compelling reasons from a, a global standpoint, looking at your health as to why, you know, losing weight is a good thing. But the main thing is you'll just feel better for, for every five pounds you can lose. Um, it's like taking off like 25 pounds of pressure off your knee or your hip. And so a lot of times people just end up feeling better. So, um, so heat or ice, another thing doesn't change the problem, but a lot of people make it, um, uh, uh, thinks that it makes you feel better. So if it works for you, then we, we endorse it. Um, anti-inflammatories are again, approved by our academy and that's things like, you know, uh, ibuprofen, Aleve or prescription strength ones like meloxicam or Salivax. Um, recently topical anti-inflammatories have uh, come off of, um, the, the um, um, where you need a prescription from them, now you can get them over the counter, and that's another reasonable option to try beforehand. And then the injections. And so the two main ones that people um, that, that we employ are cortisone, which is a steroid injection, and that's a strong anti-inflammatory delivered right to the site of, of um, pain. And the other ones are lubricating injections, or also known as hyaluronic acid. And so those, um, the evidence is not great for them, so much that our academy doesn't necessarily recommend them. They just say, you can't, that you don't have to give them. Okay. And these are sort of emerging therapy of things like PRP or stem cells. And unfortunately, the science is not there on them yet. So I, I can't look you in the eye and say that, that any of them are, are great options. <clears throat> um, Autogolous cartilage uh, transplant, that's, that's good for young people who have focal defects in their cartilage, but generally speaking for you know, the um, older population with arthritis, also not a great option. So the question is, um, you know, when, when is it a time to get a joint replacement? And um, the answer is that, you know, the, um, there's nothing as a doctor that I can do to tell you that you have to get a joint replacement. This is about you and your quality of life. And so, if you have tried all of those things and your arthritic pain is you know, preventing you from doing the things that you want to do or need to do, that's the time to start considering a knee replacement or a hip replacement. So once you've made the decision that you, you want to get a joint replacement, where are you going to do it? And so, you know, uh, what I would always say is you want to go somewhere that does a lot of these. And that's just because the more you do, um, the better you get at it. And surgery you know, is hard and sometimes things come up. And so you want a physician who's going to be able to take care of you, whether things go perfectly or whether, you know, something doesn't go perfectly. Um, <clears throat> And so, you know, the good thing is if you've gone through all of that stuff, you're really ready for a joint replacement. It can be a life-changing um, operation for you. Um, just a quick slide here. And a lot of people will ask, what are the joint replacements made of? And so they're normally some combination of the materials that are listed here. So um, <clears throat> part of the components are titanium. Oftentimes part of them are um, a, a cobalt chrome. And then sometimes they're ceramic alloys or highly engineered plastic. Um, one thing that, you know, is coming up more and more is asking about navigation or doing the, the joint replacements robotically. And so it's important to remember when you talk about a robot doing the case, the surgeon is still doing the operations, just having a t another tool to, to get things right. And so, um, and certainly at SOS, we, we do, um, use them in my personal practice. Um, I use them only when I feel like they can help me, which is the majority of the time is, is not the case. Um, partial knee replacements are good options for some people. So I would summarize it as saying, if you're a good candidate for it, it feels more like an, a normal knee. Um, but the risk of having another surgery down the line is higher than if you were to get a total knee replacement. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, the knee replacements, I always say, is a fantastic life-changing operation, not a perfect operation, though. And so you always know you have a, a, an artificial joint. It feels like metal, metal and plastic because it is. Um, but again, if you've done all the stuff leading up to it and you've got bad arthritis, it can be a, a, an absolutely life-changing operation for you. Um, <clears throat> hip replacement, basically what you do is you get rid of the arthritis where the ball and the socket are, and you replace it with metal and then bearing surfaces. Um, and you can do this, you can access the hip through um, um, several different approaches. I would say myself and most of the physicians here use one of two approaches, either going through the front called the anterior approach or 
going through the, the back, which is called the posterior approach. And that is neither one is better or worse. It's just tailored to the specific patient, how the sur what the surgeon thinks is best for them. Guys, how am I doing on time, by the way? You're doing good. Okay, good. Um, so, you know, again, um, you know, these can be life-changing operations. And so a great question that I get a lot before the operation or afterwards is how long is my joint replacement going to last? Am I too young and will I need another one? And so the answer is that every year that you have a joint replacement and that it is approximately you have a 1% risk each year of having another operation or a redo or a revision. And so that means that at 20 years, about 20% of people have had another operation, but it also means that 80 to 85% of hip and knee replacements are still in the patient and they're still working really well. Um, and so we sort of, um, another thing that you know comes up more and more recently, we I do surgery at uh, three places, at St. Joseph's Hospital, at Krauss, and then our, our one day surgery center. And um, you know what I would tell you is that they all can have great results from it. And again, this is just tailoring it to what is best for each specific patient. Um, and that you know the research has shown that you can do really well from all of those places. Um, and so this is just a you know quick picture of where we do our outpatient surgery at the surgery center. If you can have, if you're eligible for it, it's a really nice experience. Um, and so surgery, you know, at post COVID nineteen sort of um, pushed a lot of trends that were happening before the pandemic and just had them occur exponentially quicker. And so that means doing things at the surgery center, getting you home faster um, and reducing um, outpatient formal physical therapy, at least for, for hip replacements. Um, so um, uh, if you're at the surgery center, almost everybody goes home the same day. Even in the hospital now, most patients are only staying with us for one night and then going home sometime later the next morning or early the next afternoon. And this is something you know changes you know, uh, specific to each patient. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I think the, the thing to take away from here is that we do everything in our power to let you know what to, you're getting into, to get you ready to what to expect and have realistic expectations for what the rehab is like afterwards. Um, you know, surgery, unfortunately, is not without risk. If any surgeon tells you differently is um, not doing enough surgery. Um, so, you know, we always like to tell patients what you're getting yourself into. The risk of something happening is really, really low. But if you have it, if, if you have it it's 100 percent use. We want to make sure you know what you're getting into. Um, and again, the whole point of doing the, the joint replacement is to improve your quality of life. Um, and so the recovery period, knees are a little bit different than hips. So knees, I always tell patients, the first six weeks are sort of miserable. Um, it'll be six weeks, 60% of the way there, and six weeks before you're happy you did the operation. Um, but you'll continue to get used to your new hip and knee replacement for six months, a year, year and a half, even up to two years after surgery. Um, and so some common questions about like when you can do things after your joint replacement. And the answer is that there's no like uniform answer for this. And so it totally depends on what, what your expectations, what you have to do afterwards. And so if you're somebody with desk work um, or you own your own business where you're not moving around a lot, then you can go back to it pretty quickly. Sorry, it said the computer's got a mind of its own here. It keeps pushing me ahead. Um, but, you know, if you're somebody who does a heavy labor or your construction work or on your feet a lot, it's probably about three months before you're going to want to go back to work. Um, driving, um, you know, uh, biggest uh, thing that can determine when you can go back is whether it's a left side or a right side. Left is obviously faster than right. And then, you know, the, the two criteria for me are you got to be off narcotic pain medication and then you got to feel comfortable driving with a loved one in the car, whether they're with you or not. Um, so, um, you know, we tell patients uh, that if you have a joint replacement, we don't love it if you do high impact activities. If it, if it was me, I'd probably do it knowing that there's some increased risk for it. Um, and I think that's it. How did I do on time, guys? You did great. You really packed in a lot of information there. Um, right, and, I, and I'm sure that we'll have some questions that Perfect. we'll take after um, Stacy okay. has his presentation. So okay. does that sound good? That sounds good. I'm going to stop my screen sharing here. All right. Awesome. All right. So we have just transitioned over. Thank you so much, Dr. Max Greenkey. Um, we've transitioned over now to Stacy Griffith, uh, PT, who will take it from here. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. So I'm going to jump onto my screen share here. 
so uh, I took the approach of the role of physical therapy and exercise uh, in people with hip and knee arthritis. We often get a lot of questions about what are the best exercises to do, what does physical therapy do versus you could do with someone in a gym setting or environment. And so uh, a lot of these things uh, Dr. Greenfield has already gone through, so it'll save me some time as well. So just basically, you know, what arthritis does, uh, how PT can help versus going to a, a trainer or just a gym on your own. Um, some do's and don'ts of exercise. Um, I think those are pretty important uh, for people, especially if you're just starting out uh, having uh, knee or hip arthritis, how to prevent that from getting worse. Um, and then um, if you are going to have a joint replacement, we can talk a little bit about preparing for that, um, like Dr. Greenkey said. So, um, you know, just review what arthritis does is that loss of cartilage in the joint that causes inflammation and pain. And, and what we find in people that have arthritis in their hip and knee is it, is it really uh, causes you to compensate um, and kind of stay in more crumpled positions. So for hips, you may keep your your hip bent a little bit and out to the side, your knee, you don't like resting it very straight. Um, you keep it a little bit of bend to it. And over time that starts to make your joint a lot stiffer, which kind of accelerates the process of arthritis. So um, in physical therapy, um, we evaluate each joint and then provide treatment to help improve the motion of your knee or your hip, uh, increase your strength, which overall helps you decrease your pain and improve your quality of life. <clears throat> There are a lot of sources for exercises and some of them are pretty comical. I, I think you can see that picture on the side there. I think that's uh, Tony with that machine that thankfully isn't very popular anymore um, for, for exercise. But if you do a search online, uh, good old Dr. Google, um, there, last time I did it was 11,500,000 ,000 results for best knee exercises for arthritis. So there's a ton of information out there how do you know which information is right for you? Um, and, and that's where physical therapy comes in. Um, books and magazines, I don't know if people remember those, uh, those things that used to be like in the library. Um, you know, those things can be a source of information, TV infomercials like Tony to the right there. Um, your neighbors and friends, you know, I have this machine that I use or I have this video that I watch, you should try it. Those sometimes can get you in a little trouble, make your knee your feel worse. So I would devise some caution on that. I think your best source is talking with your physician and then maybe getting a visit or two with a physical therapist. Um, we want to make sure we're doing exercises that are right for you, not the top 10 best ones that you may find uh, with Dr. Google. Um, the importance of exercise is, is pretty obvious. Um, this picture kind of cracks me up because none of my patients are smiling and that happy. Um, so I don't know why those people are so uh, happy doing the stretching. Um, but Exercise does a lot of things that benefit your body, um, mainly improving your range of motion, your flexibility, and then improving strength in your legs to help, again, prolong uh, your quality of life and reduce the effects of arthritis. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I think the most important thing for me that I see with people that come with arthritis and, and uh, in their knees or hips is that really that loss of flexibility. And that really kind of gets you down a slippery slope where you stop moving. Uh, you know, you move less and less and the pain starts to become more and more. So that flexibility is, is really number one for me. Strength obviously is important, um, but most people that we see don't have a loss of strength. It's really the loss of flexibility. <clears throat> so we address that in, in, uh, with exercises and again, kind of do more what to do versus what not to do and really talking about what is good pain and what's not good pain. Um, in therapy, everyone's an individual. Um, we're going to give you exercises that we find will help you based on your evaluation and the time that we spend with you. Um, we're going to give you education. We're going to give you a lot of instruction on what, what to safely do, how your form is, so you're not adding more stress to exercise, with exercises to uh, any particular joint. Um, and again, our goal is to help improve your quality of life and slow down the arthritis process. <clears throat> I think in general, um, to do guidelines um, seem to help people the most. Um, like I said earlier, stretching is, is the most important. Um, that can be done um, with your hip or your knee in, in a couple different positions. You can do it in sitting, you can do it in stand, you can do it in lying down. It can be passive or it can be active. Um, passive would be you 
um, you know, having someone else or, or a therapist stretch out your leg. Um, you could use uh, a yoga strap or a stretch out strap to passively uh, stretch your knee or your hip. Active stretching, um, kind of like some of the pictures that I show you where you're, you know, I can't see them on my screen here, but I'm sure that, yeah. So you would stand and actively move your body to, to do a stretch in your knee or in your hip. Um, you know, we want to hold um, for a good at least 10 to 15 seconds on each stretch and then release that slowly. Um, we get a lot of people that bounce kind of like the old fashioned aerobic videos where they're kicking their leg back and forth. And, and that doesn't work very well for stretching. You have to really hold that and let that stretch take and do it repeatedly. So you're retraining that tissue around your knee or your hip to be in a more loose position versus the tight position. And, and I'm, I'm kind of a simple person when I explain things. Um, I'm a big fan of the KISS method. So good pain versus bad pain, I usually explain to my patients in, in three ways, a red light, a yellow light, or a green light, kind of like the kids game uh, that we played. Um, red light, if you do the stretch, and the more you do, the more your pain increases and it stays worse and it remains worse for several minutes, then that's probably, uh, you're doing something wrong. You're either stretching too aggressively or you're doing something that's really aggravating the joint. A yellow light is, is kind of the bent finger example. So when you're doing your stretching at home or in therapy, you know, just like when your finger backwards, you make it hurt, but when you let go, that pain goes away within a couple of seconds. That's safe. That's a yellow light. Keep going, be slow, be cautious, but keep doing the stretching and the exercise. And then obviously a green light would be the more you stretch, the better it feels, and that can start immediately. Um, you know, expect uh, progress to be slow. Uh, it takes time and you get out of it what you put into it. Um, you know, if you're doing exercises at home that are prescribed by uh, your physician uh, or your physical therapist, then, you know, uh, give it some time for things to take effect. Um, you know, your arthritis and your loss of motion and, and weakness didn't happen overnight. The results aren't going to happen um, with therapy or exercises overnight either. So it's not a microwave type fix. Um, strength and conditioning. So we recommend uh, machines and exercises like stationary bike. Um, elliptical machine, um, okay for knees, not so much for the hips. So be careful with that. Um, water aerobics and swimming are one of the best forms of exercise for arthritis patients. Um, the benefits of the water, uh, being in the water is buoyancy. Um, if you're in waist deep water, it's half your body weight on your joints and your hips and your knees and your ankles. Um, if you're up to your shoulders, it's 75% of your body weight um, reduced by the water. And so that's a great environment to exercise in if you can. So water aerobics classes, doing your own thing in, in the therapy pool at the Y. Um, and then also viscosity. The more you move against the water, the more it resists you. So it's kind of a built-in resistance machine. Um, so we, we really like uh, when people exercise uh, in a water environment. Um, and then uh, again, all exercises should be yellow and, and green lights. I think uh, as equally important as the do's are, are the don'ts. So if we're talking about knee and hip arthritis, um, I think exercises to avoid um, are listed here that you can see squatting and lunging, um, you know, your step aerobics classes, um, your weight machines, the squat racks. Those would not be something that we would recommend as physical therapists. Um, to do if you have knee or hip arthritis. Uh, the Stairmaster or Steppers, uh, again, um, there's quite a bit of force uh, on your knee uh, in particular with um, using a Stairmaster or doing a step aerobics class. Um, modification would be in the water um, or you could do the exercise without using a step again for, for like a step aerobics class. Running, I think I saw a question earlier about running and jogging. Um, I think Dr. Greenfield would probably agree with me, probably not what you wanna do for a hip or a knee uh, if you have arthritis. Um, I know you runners out there, boy, you gotta, you gotta run though, right? So um, that's just gonna accelerate uh, arthritis and, and pain that you have in your, in your knees and your hips. So I think if you can get in the water and, and run or jog in place in the water or cross country ski in the deep end, um, you will get an equally uh, satisfying workout in the water, knowing that I've done that myself and it's pretty exhausting. Um, the other machine is that bottom picture there, the Cybex knee uh, extension machine. Uh, if you have arthritis underneath your kneecap, you will know it after this machine. So be careful with this one. This will probably be one I would take off my list as well. 
Um, and then in general, any exercise that you do that's a red light, you want to avoid doing that. It's just making you worse. Um, in conclusion, I, I think your exercise program that you do should be individualized to you. Um, you know, be careful of your top 10, you know, research or your neighbor's videos or uh, magazine articles that you read. Um, it's individualized. So you should get some expert opinion and, and evaluation on that. And then if a pain consists, you want to consult with your physician. Um, and then if you get referred to physical therapy, we'll certainly help and guide you along the way. Um, and that's all that I have for my presentation uh, today. So thank you, everyone. I'll turn it back over to Jess. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, it's both of you are so informative and deliver the information with such um, great poise and professionalism. It's really a benefit to us to be able to be here and witness and learn from you. All right. I'm having, I am just right now working on getting us all spotlight. Okay, here we go. All right, so um, the final part of our portion today is really going to be a Q&A. So I would like to encourage folks to please type your questions into the chat if you are able to do that um, so that they can come through. I already have a few questions that we're going to get started with that came in from via email from some of our friends who emailed ahead of time. Um, and then I also see that we have a friend who has their hand raised. So we will kind of go in that order where I will go um, from the things that came in from email, the things in the chat, and then our friends um, with their hands raised. Okay, does that sound good to everybody? All right, I see some nods. All right, um, and I will also just ask if you can please keep your microphone <coughs> muted um, until we call on you. That will just help everybody with our quality of sound. Okay, thank you so much. All right. So one of the questions that we had come in through email was from Sue, who wanted to know what your opinions are on turmeric with black pepper and glucosamine supplements for arthritis. Um, so I guess I can take this one, Stacey. So I can tell you that the science is not great on them. So there's been no like, you know, vetted scientific literature that says it's helpful. It's unlikely that it's going to hurt you though. And so some people really swear by it. So I wouldn't recommend it, but if you were on it already and you think it's working for you, then, um, then I wouldn't have a problem with it, but I can't recommend it wholeheartedly. All right. Thank you so much, doctor. All right. Next, we have kind of a suite of uh, questions about knee replacements. So I'll just ask them one at a time um, and whoever feels best equipped to take it can go ahead and take it. So the first one is, can you talk about the difference in outcomes using robotic knee replacement surgery? Yeah. So it's a really great, you know, hot topic. And a lot of it is marketing now. And we do have robots that we use. And so again, none of the literature has shown that clinical outcomes change when you use a robot or you don't. Um, and so in my practice, I do use it, but it's generally for a specific reason. So somebody um, who needs, uh, who has a bad deformity, or there's a reason that I can't use the other guides that I normally use. And that's when I would use it. Um, partial joint replacements are technically a little harder and sometimes the robot can be helpful for that. And so I tend to use it more for those as well. All right. um, but on a routine day to day, uh, I'm not using it um, often unless, unless there's a reason. All right. Thank you so much. So it sounds, it sounds like using it as part of your toolkit, right? And not exactly. necessarily just, just not as the only tool in your kit. Yeah. Excellent. Um, sounds good to have a doctor who is informed and ready to make the right decisions. All right. Um, so the next question is, um, what can be done about continued pain in one knee post replacement? If you've had both knees replaced, but one of them just continue three years, continues to like really give you a lot of trouble three years out. And is this just something that should be expected for some people? Right. So that's a really hard question to answer because it could be for a, one of a bunch of reasons. So obviously, um, if they haven't already, they should go back to their surgeon and make sure that they're evaluated to make sure that there's not a mechanical or biological reason that they're having continued pain. Um, if they're not happy with that, then I would go to another surgeon and get another opinion. And that being said, some people, you know, it's, it's a really good operation, but it's not perfect. And, you know, for some people, um, you know, they're just not happy with it. It's a really small percentage of people in the neighborhood of five to 10%, um, but it can happen. So the way that I start with that is you start sort of systematically ruling out those mechanical and biological reasons for having continued pain. And that can be 
like one of a, a variety of things. And so it totally depends on the patient. So it sounds like best course of action is to perhaps go back to their surgeon yeah. and engage in a conversation with Absolutely. them. Absolutely. And then, you know, and uh, for, for me, if it were my patient and I couldn't figure it out, then it's always, it's never the wrong reason or the wrong thing to go have somebody else see you. All right. Thank you for that. Um, all right, I, I have another question that's also in the double knee replacement world um, for a patient that is preoperative. So if you are planning to have a double knee replacement, um, will rehab of that post-operative knee create new problems for your back or preoperative knee? Um, and what can be done to reduce the possibility of worsening or new back or knee problems in your existing back and knee while recovering from the surgery of your new knee while waiting for the other one? Oh my God. Well, um, so I think it, a, a loaded question, Stacey, do you have any thoughts on that? My, I think it's having a good therapist on your side. Yeah. So we see this once in a while, someone has a pre-existing back condition and they have a knee replacement, hip replacement. It'll alter the way they walk and put some extra pressure on their back. And in our office, we, we treat that uh, when they're here. And, and a lot of times as time goes on after a couple of weeks, when they start to normalize their walking and get things back to moving normal, um, a lot of times that back pain will subside. So um, it happens once in a while. It's not very often, um, but certainly mention that to your therapist postoperatively and, and we will certainly uh, keep our eye on that and address that if it does pop up. So it won't impact um, your rehab um, uh, for your joint replacement, um, but you may have a little bit of increased pain for a couple of weeks or so, which certainly will go away as you get moving around normal again. And I'm going to ask a follow-up question. Um, if somebody has some fear around this, like increased pain, is there something that they can do before the surgery in terms of physical therapy to build strength or sort of like work on things to maybe reduce some of that generalized pain or soreness? Yeah, absolutely. So all of our, a great program that we have, all of our joint replacement patients are referred to a visit or two of physical therapy before their surgery. And that would be the point where we would address uh, any other pre-existing conditions. And then we give them exercises to prepare their leg, uh, whether it be hip or knee, um, for the surgery, but also to have a quick recovery afterwards. We've been doing this about five or six years and the results are amazing. Um, people are, are done with joint replacements uh, anywhere between four and six weeks, um, which is about 10 to 12 days higher than the net or lower than the national average. So um, because we start people sooner and we prepare them before surgery, it really helps them get better quicker afterwards. So it really gives them a nice head start. So yes, we would definitely uh, see you before your surgery um, to get you going. And then just to, you know, because of, I just, you know, want to ask more questions about the back pain. If you do come in, let's say for a hip or a knee replacement and you are, you know, sort of like given those, that's what the main meeting is about. Could you also mm -hmm. introduce like this back thing and be like, could you also give me some, in, some exercises for this? Or would that be like beyond the scope of working together? No, it wouldn't be. And, and if the doctor puts it on the prescription, we certainly can evaluate and treat that too. But a lot of times it's basically, you know, the do's and the don'ts too, that help too, you set up straight, how to sit with good posture, how to avoid bending at the waist to do certain things, which unfortunately for nip, hip and knee arthritis, people start bending more at the back, which tend to aggravate things versus trying to squat down and, and grab things from the floor, stuff like that too. So it's definitely all part of the process. All right, thank you for really digging deep on that one. I really appreciate it. Sure. Um, we have another, we have a question and this one is about osteopenia and osteoarthritis. Um, so this is from Gina and Gina wanted to know what recommendations you have for someone with osteopenia um, which, or osteoarthritis um, who, or not osteo, osteoporosis, sorry, osteopenia and osteoporosis, um, who wants to stay fit, enjoys jogging and walking many miles a week, but doesn't enjoy weight training, but is concerned about potential fractures and bone loss. Um, and they really wanted to know, do things like jogging 10 to 20 miles a week contribute to bone loss? 
Right. So um, there's a difference in uh, when you hear them, they sound very similar. There's osteoarthritis, which is wearing out of the cartilage and soft tissue of a joint, and then osteoporosis and osteopenia, which is lowering your bone density. Um, and so two different separate problems, right? Um, and so I'm not an expert in osteoporosis, osteopenia, but the general recommendation is that weight-bearing exercises can help maintain your bone density. Um, there's a recommended uh, a daily amount of uh, calcium and vitamin D supplements that patients should be on. Um, and, um, um, and then other than that, you should get a good primary care physician and, and potentially an endocrinologist if you are diagnosed with either of those things. Right. So cons your recommendation is to consult an expert in... Uh, consult an expert, but, but in general, high impact exercise is good for bone density. Okay, so jogging would be recommended. Or, or walking um, or skiing or elliptical, all those things. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Thank you. All right, um, we have a question from Nicole who wanted to know what are the best exercise machines for hip injuries if ellipticals are not good? Um, that's a general question. So what kind of hip injury would be my, my question to that too, but yeah. Um, um, I have labral tears and so I have like the pain going down and I know with biking it's like a stand-up bike usually causes pain as well so I yeah. didn't know like is there general recommendations for um get, the get in the water what yeah. you want. which I have started um, so <laughs> um recumbent bike probably a little bit better than upright bike um again I would probably stay away from Stairmaster stay away from like the rolling machine um does look to go bother you it does, that rotation does. So yeah. I don't know if sitting was still an issue. Like if you recommend to people that have hip pain, like sitting in the recumbent is okay because I just didn't want to purchase something and then realize right. it was not a good idea. Yeah, if you can try it out first at a gym and, and make sure it's, you know, uh, doesn't, it isn't a red light, then, then, you know, that would be okay to do. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, we have a question from Celine who wants to know more about the anterior approach hip replacement and wants to know if that requires special training and how many SOS physicians do it. Okay, so it's a great question. Um, the answer, I wouldn't say that it requires special training, but it requires training, if that makes sense. So if you're um, somebody like, you know, I had good experience with it in my residency and my fellowship. And so um, it's not anything special that I did outside of that, but I did a lot of it. And so I feel really comfortable with it. Um, and so as do a bunch of the surgeons here at SOS, I think there's five or six of us that do it. Um, and what I would tell you is, you know, first you should choose a surgeon that you're comfortable with. It's going to take great care of you and then sort of let them choose what's best for you. And that's coming from somebody who does the anterior approach some of the time and does other approaches the other times. And I tailor it to what I think is going to be, you know, the, the best thing for that specific patient. And it's just weighing the risks and the benefits of each one. If that, does that answer the question? Good. All right. Um, if it doesn't, Celine, feel free to enter a follow-up question. We've got a question from Patrick who wants to know um, if you have any recommendations of brands of replacement joints um, and also which ones do you use, uh, recommend, and why? Okay, that's a great question that we get a lot. And so I would say there's a handful of companies that are on the market that are really common all over the United States and all of them have replacements that do really well. And so in most circumstances, what dictates it is where we do the surgery. And so each hospital has, may have different contracts with different vendors or different systems. Um, and then in rare circumstances with specific deformities or the size of the patient, or if there's specific risk factors, we may choose a specific company, but the vast majority of them, we, we use one of the five major manufacturers in, in the United States. And it's based, like I said, on, on where we do the surgery. All right. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Jean in the chat, um, but I'm not exactly sure what that means. Oh, okay. Here we go. Okay. Thanks for the clarification, Jean. All right. Um, so how often and for how long should each session be to ride a recumbent bike? 
um, after often per week after two total knee replacements and total hip replacements, um, with alternating swimming laps. So I guess you like a recommendation for a exercise routine between recumbent bikes and swimming after knee and hip replacements. Uh, okay. I'll take that one. Um, so I, I think Gene, you're asking me how long should you ride the recumbent bike and then how often a week? So I would do, so in therapy, because of our space and time, we, we do about 10 minutes or so, but in the gym, you could probably do, you know, at least 10 or 15 minutes of, of biking, um, you know, three days a week. And then you can alternate on the other two days, the, the, um, swimming, if you want to do that. So I would do it at least three times a week. Um, that seems to be a good sweet spot for people to get the benefit of, of using the, the bicycle for range of motion and conditioning. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I see that we have our friend Lorraine who has their hand up. Lorraine, would you like to come off mute and ask your question? Thank you. Yes. I wanted to ask Dr. Greenkey on average, how many knee replacements do you do in a week or a month? I'm sorry, I got distracted here for a second. I don't know if you just, that was my dad walking by. He's one of the other <laughs> joint replacement surgeons here. So he brought us lunch. Um, what was the question again? Uh, on average, how many knee replacements do you personally do um, per week or per month? So um, on average, I would say um, eight to 10 a week. And that can, you know, up, up or down a little bit. Thank you. Uh, Yep. All right. Thank you. Um, you know, and I have, I have a sort of a personal question as a former dancer and athlete who has lots of knee problems um, and has had to kind of reduce the kinds of activities. What kinds of um, recommendations might you give to someone who is in their thirties, but is sort of dealing with um, osteoarthritis in the knees, knee injuries, and other things like that to try to really extend the life of um, the damaged <laughs> um, body that you have? Yeah. That's a, it's a great question and one we see, you know, a lot. Um, and so what I would say, there's nothing you can do to really reverse it. Um, but that being said, we want you to be active. Um, <clears throat> we want you to, um, you know, do things to make you happy, but like pain should be your guide. So if like your knees are hurting you when you do something that's your body cell and telling you, it's sort of like Stacy's red light, green light, don't do that. Um, but the best thing you do is be active, maintain a healthy body weight that takes some pressure off your joints. And then, you know, try all those conservative things and don't move up the ladder of um, until, you know, the previous one has stopped working. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, do we have any other? Oh, we have a one more question from Slim, which wants to know how many hips you do a week. Oh, and I, I would say that what I answered before, it's eight to 10 is joint replacement. So a hip or a knee, and that varies week to week. So you could say five and five. So high volume. Yeah. And, I, and, and it's not, you know, the, the, the one thing about us, SOS is that we've got a bunch of guys who are efficient and do a great job. And so, um, you know, as I said before, when you, when, if you decide that a joint replacement is right for you, you want to go somewhere that um, they're going to take really good care of you and they're used to doing it and used to handling everything. Um, Cause the more streamlined it can be, the better, the better you'll be at it and the better it is for patients. Um, I see that Lorraine has her hand up again. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, do you recommend using a, a hinge knee support when one wants to do, I have osteoarthritis in both knees and the right knee is going to be replaced in the fall, yeah. probably by your dad or yourself. Anyway, right. the, the use of a hinge knee brace uh, for, say, for example, if I was going to be walking around the block or going up and down stairs a lot or just being generally very active and on my feet. Do you think a hinge knee brace is okay? Um, so I think it's okay. It's not going to do any harm. Um, so there's, and there's two types of uh, braces that we commonly use in arthritis. And so the one is a hinge knee brace. And that is generally for people who feel like their knee is unstable. And that's a subjective feeling when you're walking around, like it's going to give out on you. There's another kind of brace called a medial offloader brace, which changes the pressure to take some pressure off of where the arthritis is. And that is okay too. Again, the science behind those is not great, but if it's for somebody who wants to have a really active summer, who feels like it can be helpful to them, I'm, I'm completely in favor of it. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Um, I see Mary has her hand raised. 
Mary, you need to take yourself off mute. My question is, um, during knee replacement, are the is your leg realigned if your if your knees have become so problematic that they're bowed during knee replacement? Is there a realignment of your leg? So the, the short answer is yes. So um, it may not be all the way there, but it gets pretty darn straight. Okay, thanks. Of course. And I uh, think so much. And um, does that answer your question, Mary? Um, it does, only that I'm the one with the long question before, only that once one leg is nice and straight, but your other knee is terrible and you have to have that one replaced, is that going to make any balance? Is that going to create some problems in some sense? Because so one knee a, works and the other one is still bowed out. So it's, it's a great question that you're asking. And so we uh, historically, we did both knees at the same time sometimes, and we now rarely do that for, for a bunch of reasons. The one you know exception to that is if somebody's so bow-legged or not kneed, that it makes that they can't walk, we would consider doing both at the same time. The vast majority of people though, we don't do that and you can walk okay, but it's not unusual for you to get one done and then have the other one sort of be noticed more and say, oh gosh, I got a bad knee here too. And then eventually end up getting that taken care of too. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Of course. Um, did you have something else to add? Nope, I'm done, okay. thank you. All right, um, and I see that we have a question from Constance who is asking about um, exercise recommendations for people that have hands and feet riddled with bone spurs. Oh, you, Max. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah Stacy's making. Uh, I'm gonna, yeah, go for it. Um, I personally don't see a lot of people with, uh, for hands and feet, but we do have. Uh, hand therapy department that I would recommend at least for that and then one of our hand specialists at SOS um, maybe help you with some of the pain and then the hand therapy department can give you some exercises for that um, similar to to the feet so we do have therapists that are um, specialized in working with people that have um, ankle and foot problems um, again we have a specialty group for our doctors too that you can uh, visit there first and then that will give you some guidance. And then um, one of our therapists will be able to do that uh, for you as well to help with the bone spurs and, and working on the pain management of that. So I would definitely uh, seek uh, some guidance from the physician and then get into either the hand therapy department or one of our specialists in the foot and ankle. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, it looks like we've made our way through all of the questions that have come through via email, via the chat, and also from folks in the room uh, with their hands raised. So uh, as I usually do, I would love to ask first, uh, Dr. Greenkey um, and then Stacy, if you have any final parting words that you would like to leave with us today. No, oh, I would um, just thanks everybody for joining and for your attention and your questions. and. Um, um, you know, if we can ever, you know, be of help to you, you know, come see us. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, we see a lot of people that have arthritis and, and, um, and our job is to help you improve your quality of life and, and give you some exercise that help kind of prolong, um, you know, the effects of arthritis and, and impact on that. So I uh, appreciate everyone's time and, and, uh, and joining us today. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Greenkey, and also Stacy, for your generosity, for your expertise, um, and for engaging all of us today. It's really been such a gift um, to learn from you, to listen to you, and to also have you answer all of our questions. So I speak on behalf of the Y to just say we are so grateful for your participation and your partnership, um, and this really informative, and I would also dare to say entertaining, maybe, uh, lunch and learn. Um, it was a real pleasure to um, spend this time with you and also get to know you um, just a little bit more. So um, without, oh, and I see we have one more question, which wants to, uh, uh, Celine wants to know where you see your patients. Uh, I'm on the uh, Oswego Road location in Liverpool. 
And I'll say that I think that the SOS website has a lot of information on it. So um, if you right. go and check out SOSbones.com, you'll find lots of information um, where you can figure out how to get connected to the folks that you'd like to get connected to. But if you have additional specific questions for um, Stacy or Dr. Max Green Key, you can send them to me and then I can forward them to the appropriate people so that they can um, connect you through those channels. All right. So Without further ado, I'd love to say good afternoon to everyone else. Enjoy your lunch. Carolyn wants you to say hi to your dad and uncle from former patients. Um, <laughs> and we've got lots of gratitude pouring into the chat. So Perfect. thanks, everyone. Thanks. thanks so much, everybody. All Thank right. you. Enjoy okay. the rest of your days. Bye-bye.